For June 30th, 2023, we talk about Street Fighter VI, Dungeons and Dragons 5e, Diablo 4, and What the Car 3. I mean, What the Car. It's it's just What the Car. Welcome to the 463rd level. My name is Cole Ross. I'm Dennis Furia. I'm David Mysmith. And I'm Jala Prendes. And you are listening to The Level. It's a podcast for people who love video games. Jala, welcome back. Thank you. I realized yeah. I had not been on this month and it was like, oh, snap. Yeah. And <laughs> ben, ben Ben was kind enough to uh, come down with an illness. Uh, so <laughs> that's what happens. I threw him he, in the cistern he actually, and he got yeah, sick. He's really <laughs> he went and exposed himself intentionally to give Jala some space. To play yeah, him, so. he's a really selfless guy. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but no, uh, what's going on? I won a bush knife from a blacksmith that I follow on Twitter named Randall Blademaker, who has some oh. really baller stuff. Hey, Man, he yeah. was he was born for that career. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Yeah. So it's named our, Randall our blade, blade Maker. <laughs> our Blade Maker on Twitter. So uh folks could go check out his work mm-hmm. and everything. Um nice. yeah. So very cool. Very cool. Mm-hmm. I was very excited about that. And then also other fun stuff is that um my Jala Chan's place friends bought me the Street Fighter Six game for my Ooh. birthday as oh, a collective wow. thing because you know that game is like seven thousand dollars. Not really. I mean, but it's it's like full no, price no, it's... new game, expensive, freaking yeah. And yeah. I don't have money. So <laughs> they, they were kind enough to give that to me. So I will talk a little tiny bit about that in the grind, but I recently got it. I haven't played a whole lot, but I will talk about it. Yeah, nice. Well, that was very nice of them. Yeah, absolutely. And they gave mm-hmm. it to me like a month early just because they knew that I really wanted to play. And like everybody else was talking about it. And I'm like, sad panda in the corner. So they just <laughs> decided to give it to me. Like, please just give give this person <laughs> this thing I, and maybe make them stop being sad panda in the corner. It's bringing me down, you know? <laughs> like, I have so little concept of time like just how quickly this year has gone by that you Mm -hmm. said they got it for your birthday. And I thought, Oh, nice. A late birthday gift. (laughs) I I, I, I know, I know that your birthday is in July, Jala, uh, July, uh, as, uh, as, as we, as we say, that's Uh, good. Yeah. Um, but, uh, in my head, we were far earlier in the year where it would make sense that that would be a late gift instead of an early gift. So I know like this whole year is just kind of wild. The fact that we're like at the end of June right now is just, I don't know. I can't really wrap. I'm like, 4th of July is next week. What is going on? <laughs> oh, so. I, earlier tonight, I was talking with uh, with Jen. She's like, oh, we haven't heard from these friends that always do a 4th of July party. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, yeah, well, they did it Memorial Day last year. Like, because it was so <laughs> recent, it can't have been. Oh, my God. We're already back around to 4th of July. So, <laughs> yeah. Nuts. Oh, man. Uh, David, how about you? What's going on? Uh, not too much. I'm back home in uh, in Mansfield, uh, you know, doing a visit. Cool. Uh, yeah, you know, did a run out today to the the leather shop and the uh, fabric store up in Amish country. So mm-hmm. um, got some lining fabric for a jacket I'm working on. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah honestly, that's that's uh, about it. Just, you know, just yeah. been keep it on, keep it on. You can find some cool stuff out in Amish country. There are oh, lots yeah, of cool, like, yeah, cool little it's, it's not all oak, uh, oak furniture and hard candies. Right, exactly. <laughs> maybe, maybe mostly, but <laughs> actually, I think uh, I I meant to get a uh, snap a picture of it um, on the way back. One of the uh, Amish, I don't know, restaurants or whatever uh, sold uh, uh, boba tea. Oh, okay. Nice. All right, all right. <laughs> hey, you know, other cultures don't have a uh, they, they don't have a monopoly on tapioca beads. That's nope. what's in boba. Mm-hmm. Is that what that is? That, that I, is I mean, that I'm is. convinced it's, it's frog eggs, but <laughs> <laughs> actually, well, no, I'll, the... I'll I'll put a picture in the Slack. I had an encounter with um with boba tea recently that I love, um mm-hmm. and uh, and my kids did not quite have the same reaction. So mm. let me see if I can Ooh. find that. Now, um, 
Nice. Well, I've got... <laughs> <laughs> this will make me sound like a jerk. There, there are things going on with family wise that are made that make it a little bit unpredictable. But if I can mm-hmm. manage to, to, to get out, <laughs> we should meet up, David. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice. Uh, I'm not gonna. Uh, well, no, De- Dennis is gonna be searching for that picture, so he'll probably. I found it. Yeah. Boom. You found it. Uh, let's mm-hmm. see here. Going into the chat. Where are we at? Should be yep. should be come through any moment uh, now. Oh, he didn't <laughs> expect it. He didn't no. expect it. Yeah. He, <laughs> huh. Like he he almost went for it, and then there was a thought, and then that happened. It was like, no. yeah. And just let it let it roll out onto the table. Which uh, uh, you you know, I just, I just for me, text like food texture has been a big thing my entire life. Mm-hmm. More so when I was a kid, but I really associate like, uh, yeah, no boba tea seems like it'd be a varsity texture for a kid to deal with yeah for I, me, I guess the, I, yeah I, I think it's a really fun texture but see for I, me, i'm also not a the, kid. like <laughs> seal thing over top of it kind of bothers me mm. Mm. uh mm-hmm. like i i know that that is definitely how like uh umbrella corp would would package uh a thing oh without a doubt yeah huh um You're- Dennis, how about you? Well, what's going on besides exposing your children to yeah. uh, exotic textures? <laughs> they, you know, that place also had rolled ice cream and they were big fans of that. So okay. made, made up for it. Uh, no, I, I was at Origins this past week. Oh, that's right. No big deal. Um, first time at a convention that I actually had product to sell for Deck of Wonders. Um, and I'll, I will, since I'm sending pictures left and right, and this is it's the perfect thing for an audio medium. Uh, we do will, we do it on abject suffering all the time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I will pop a picture of my booth um, up into there, um, but it was it was phenomenal. Um, just you know, I, I, being able to actually sell the game, have people be into it. The number of people that came up to the booth and were like, "I backed. It's awesome. Love the game so much. What oh, are you man. doing? Expansions? Like, just I I." never would have expected that so oh that's um, great yeah it was it was fantastic uh if you listen and you swung by um thank you so much did uh, uh did, did anybody say like hey i listened to the show i there was at least uh, i'm trying to remember now no no one no one mentioned the show at the con but mm-hmm. i think there were some people who who said they might be at the con in gotcha, the gotcha gotcha so yeah uh i mean it was all such a whirlwind while you're there that like <laughs> I, I just I just pitched nonstop, and I probably am am like saying the pitch uh, for Deck of Wonders in my sleep. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, since I've been back, just because like it was it was nonstop. Like talk about the idea of the game, show the little one turn demo, make a transaction if that's what they're going to do, or say bye, and then the next person's up at the booth, and you're mm-hmm. doing it again. And I was a one man show, so I <laughs> oh, I did not move from behind that table um, for the eight hours a day or, or what have you that the wow. con was going. But like I, I loved every second of it. It was so much freaking fun, um, and obviously like hugely validating. Like that's yeah, uh, that's that's badass. Cannot I, be understated. I mean, to have it go into real life, you know, mm-hmm. like actually, mm-hmm. you know, make it real. I mean, I, for 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 me, you know, I, I know that my job is real. I, I, it has to be, <laughs> please. But like it, it, the, the, those times, those times when you go to a physical place and you know enact something, whether or not you're like meeting people who are like fans or whatever, that is separate from it. But like to actually leave your house and do something outside of your usual bubble with yeah, it, yeah, I, I yeah. feel that so hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that was that was super exciting. Um, Foreteller, the like audio narration app um, that that Deck of Wonders is a part of, uh, did a party one of the nights. Uh, and they turned the basement of a bar into a dungeon. Oh, that's like cool. a D&D dungeon complete with gelatinous cube. Yay. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be slinging these pictures they, left and right. But yeah, it they was, had it was so a much uh, jello. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, but it was it was like, you know, green see through tarps made to look like a cube that went from floor to ceiling. And then there was something going on with black lights in the inside that it was very luminous. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could go inside and get pictures of you like stuck inside the, the gelatinous yeah. cube. So, um, you know, all the really fun nerdy stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's actually, that's actually where the majority of my uh, games discussion will come from. So normally I would be using the games that I played at origins to shoehorn gaming talk into the banter. Okay. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm going to use it as what I played this week. So, yeah, no, you're just um, gonna you're, you're gonna you're gonna use it. Uh, yeah, no, to give us warning. 
<laughs> I gotta say, those uh, I, I I really like your stands, like the uh, the, the, the yeah. graphic stands that are there. Yes. I never I'd never seen one like the uh, like the larger one. Um, that's yeah, uh, that, that's this was cool. its first outing. That yeah. was the, so the backdrop is is a giant uh, picture of Cullen, who's the first like villain of the game, mm-hmm. um, and he's he kind of the the. I, I, you want to say poster child, but you know, like a poster child that you're supposed to hate. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's and, a, uh, the, that, that is like the face or cover image that I associate. Uh, yeah, with, so uh, with, yeah. Mm-hmm. Up there challenging passersby and there's a forest troll as well. Yeah. I, I think it came together very nicely mm-hmm. um, and cannot wait to, uh, to do another con Gen cons coming up. Um, I'll start pumping that now. Uh, my stuff is going to be in Lauren, the illustrator's booth. Um, that is table 42 in the art show. Oh, that's a blessed number to have at a yeah, geek it con. Is. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, here's something that I did not know because Lauren is far too modest. She is doing the cover art for Gen Con's program this year. Holy cow. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a, huge awesome. a lot of fun. Yeah. So, um, that, and that, that art is already out there and circulating. They have a whole blog post interviewing her about it. It is beautiful. (laughs) Um, and I, I'm just so excited for her. So excited to be able to be at her booth. Um, yeah, every everything's coming up deck of wonders right now. No, and and she's she's doing big stuff too, isn't she? Like you, I know at one point you said that she was doing, uh, like big comic publisher stuff. Yeah, she uh, she had a cover for uh, a Black Panther issue, Mm -hmm. uh, in March. Nice. Uh, and yeah, it's badass. So she is a badass all around. Um, I can't wait to be there and actually like hang out with her in person again. She wasn't able to get to origins. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a, a lot of exciting stuff happening. And like I said, the, the, the origins went as well as it possibly could have. Oh, that's uh, awesome to hear. Has me excited to do it again. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll pop in as well. I bought myself a new play mat. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to pull up the corner here so I can read who, who did it. It's art, uh, by Brent Chumley. Um, and I will, I'll put that into the chat as well. Um, but upgraded, I, I got a significantly larger play, uh, not play mat, um, uh, mouse pad oh, yeah. than, uh, than I, than I have had before. So Thanks. all kinds of good geek stuff. Yeah. I, man, I don't know. I, 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 I got nothing aside from aforementioned family thing. It's been raining up here, so I've not been able to get out in the woods for more than a week. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of going nuts with that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that's, a uh, get out in the woods. It makes it sound like, a, like I need to be like, just like a feral bear person. No, uh, just, uh, for, for, I mean, we, you don't not need to be a feral bear. Person. I, I need to, I need to retrain my spells. Damn it. I haven't been able to swap out my spell lists for like <laughs> the entire level. Yeah. Uh, uh-uh. <laughs> that mouse pad is cute. Um, yeah. So that's really all that's going on is stuff that I haven't been doing and spending mm. more time more time at the gym in lieu of that which is good because you know keep the habit going but also when i finish there i immediately feel like falling asleep <laughs> i just get home and just just want to i'm just I'm the sleepiest boy who's ever been so i feel you on that yeah um cool well i think we should talk about some games and to do that we need to do the regular kind of show with the grind the multiplayer and the end boss and why don't we get start? oh actually no back up back up um oh. No recording next week because of July the 4th. Uh, we record on Tuesdays. July the 4th is on a Tuesday. I don't want to have us record on a holiday. So no episode next week. We're turning the week after that. Okay, cool. Uh, multiplayer and the grind. And why don't we get started with... The grind. The grind, where we talk about the games we've been playing over the past period of time or so. Jala, uh, what you been playing? Okay, so I have continued to play Fire Emblem Engage because, you know, I took a hiatus from it for a little bit. And then, and then I got back to it. I'm on hour so 62. So you re-engaged? Whoa, Ooh. 62. 62. Ah. <laughs> nice. I'm on chapter 20 out of 26 of the main game. So uh, it's holding holding your attention pretty cool, pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I got like thirty to forty, thirty or forty hours in uh, before I set it down, and I had to set it down because I had other assignment play, um, mm-hmm. because I had the Resident Evil Four episode of Tales of the Backlog to do, uh, and then I had Metroid Fusion to do for my podcast. Um, you know, Jala Chance Place that'll be next week actually when that drops. Uh, by, by the time we're recording, so 
Uh, there is no level that week. So that means you can listen <laughs> to that if you like fusion or don't like fusion or whatever. It's a three and a half hour long episode. It's freaking nice. massive. Yeah. It's a very Ooh. good episode, though. I will tell you that it's very good. So <laughs> anyway, um, but after all of that assignment play, I got back to this game. And I finished all of the Divine Paralogues, which are from the DLC, and that's where you unlock extra emblem bracelets. So you have extra emblems that you can assign to your units in battle during the main quests. So I did that, and then I also finished all of the regular paralogs that show up as you play. So uh, the regular paralogs in there, the way that they work them in is the those paralogs are not like random missions they have like skirmishes and training battles and stuff on the map that you can play you know anytime you want to if you want to grind but the paralogs themselves are always um about one of the emblems that you have from the mainline quests Mm mm-hmm And in these, you fight against one of those emblems on a field of battle, which is a recreation of a map of story significance to that emblem's game. So, you know, like when it's one from like three houses, it's a one particular really uh, notable field of battle where, you know, major plot story stuff happens and this, that and the other. And, uh, you know, you have to fight Baleth there, of course, and... Mm -hmm. Whatever. And the emblem is, of course, not usable in your set of emblems for the duration of that battle. And whenever you win that battle, you unlock the max bond level with them, which allows you and your units to bond with the emblem past the original level cap of 10 up to level 20 to get additional skill unlocks. Because the inheritance system that was present in some of the other Fire Emblem games, you know, with um, children and stuff like that. Yeah, from has Awakening been sw- onward. Yeah, yeah it has, well, actually, it was before that, too, that some of the oh. units could get married. But anyway, um, I have an emb- I have a Fire Emblem episode coming up, too. That's another mm-hmm. reason i got to finish this. <laughs> this is also assignment play. <laughs> hey, anyway, hey, no. Um, <laughs> your, your content creator disease is progressing nicely. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I, I decided I was going to tackle the whole IP, so luck to Jesus. me. Jesus. Yeah, so so talking in broad strokes. But anyway, um, so um, the inheritance system, though, was switched from being like lineage because you had to characters copulate and have children to now um, it's just like you inherit them when your people fight alongside paired up with an emblem via an emblem ring. And then the longer they fight together, they form a bond and then they unlock Basically, it unlocks both skills that are available to that unit using that emblem in battle, like on the active map. So like they have more and more things available to them as they bond with that emblem. But then also they can inherit skills like just for their own use when they are not using that ring. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of like a dual thing. Like you can actually potentially have them bond with a couple of emblems and then just have all of the skill skill upgrades of one and then be paired with another one and then just have everything maxed out, you know. I'm not really a min-max player at all, so I'm very haphazard. Like, all of my emblems <laughs> and all of the skills everybody has are just, like, nonsense. It, it, like, it makes more sense now, but, like, at first I had no idea what characters I was going to get, if they would change classes, you know, like what emblems they were going to be. Like, I I didn't know any of that and I didn't bother looking it up. So Mm -hmm. um, as a result, it's pretty willy nilly. But I feel like this game, it it struck me that this is kind of like Final Fantasy tactics in that it would be a lot smoother on a replay, mechanically speaking, because you would be familiar with all of that. Yes. So... Yeah. Um, that's about all I really have to say about that. Like, you know, the story stuff, I got <laughs> even more people in this game. It feels too. And I don't know if it's just because, um, you know, I've been talking a lot of fire emblem stuff recently, you know, uh, thinking about the IP as a whole or anything, but like, I really feel like this game needs the permadeath in it, even though like I, I put it on casual and I put it on normal mode just because I was like, I just want to see the story the first time through and figure out what's going on before I, mm-hmm. you know, try to up the ante. Yeah, and yeah. then like on a replay, that's when I can fiddle with all of that stuff. 
Um, but boy, it makes me tired to have to switch out all these units and try to keep everybody adequately yeah. leveled and stuff. It, like it, the game's <laughs> designed for attrition. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's designed for you to like lose units. And so like having this many units, it's like I have like seven of you guys. I really don't need another one, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. so but that's why you can reclass them and this, that and the other. But that takes work. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, here's a question. Yeah. Um, now that you've played more of it, uh, do they include characters or content from the sacred stones? Uh, because if they were not cowards, they would bring it in, even though that is out of continuity. Um, remind me what characters are in there, because I actually don't <laughs> remember the names of the, of the things a, as much as the a, characters. There's, there's a blue haired one. I think it's a guy. I think there's a green haired girl. <laughs> Oh, you I don't know, know who they were. Okay, let me. I'm no. gonna have to look up and see which which one that is. Like, who are the main characters in Sacred Stones? Yeah. So, I think what well, I think Alex is a name that uh that that rings that rings <laughs> oh, a bell. Oh, that's Erica and what's his head? Yeah, yeah, they've got them in there. Uh, Erica yeah. and Ephraim. Yes. Yeah, yeah, those guys. Gotcha. Yeah, they're in there. Okay. Like, I no. think they have um representation for uh, like if not all of them, um at least a large portion of the games. And then there are no longer, uh, they are no longer cowards. Well, what's cool about um, Erica and Ephraim is that like uh, they are both in one ring because they are twins and you can toggle between which one you want to have active Hmm. and you can like switch between them and they have different skills and stuff available to them. Nice. Any other questions about Fire Emblem Engage, which I continue to play? (laughs) No. Cool. So you're at hour 62. Yeah. Uh, how, give me a guess right now how many hours in you will be when you decide you're done with the game. Um, I'm, I'm not like grinding at all. I am just doing the paralogs. Oh, I forgot to say I also did the first of the Fel Xenologs, which is a totally different DLC thing that's like a totally different story about something set in the future. I don't know what it's all about because i only played one map of it i don't know how long it is it's a dlc thing um i have all of the dlc and i have the main game i am not going through any skirmishes or any training battles all i am doing is the mainline stuff and then just going through the paralogs to unlock stuff so i will be done when the missions are done and there's no more missions that's when i will be done all right fair enough and I've got uh, seven more of those because I'm on 20, but I haven't started that map yet. So. Hmm. Um, yeah. Cool. I've got no more questions. Take Great. us to the sixes. Yeah, the sixes. So the next thing is Street Fighter six, which, uh, again, I haven't played a whole lot of. I've played like three hours of. I, unfortunately, from the beta, like if, if I had made my critter my uh entity my (laughs) my avatar in the dem or yeah in the demo then it would have ported over to the main game but i did not i made it Mm. in the beta which was actually uh, i found out a version of the game that came that was uh, like developed as of like a year ago so it's like a an older version that doesn't actually mesh up with gotcha. the main game like the way it is now you know programming hmm. wise so um i lost my perfect model that i spent all that time on oh, no. making in the beta and i tried to remake it and dave is like looking at me and looking at the thing and he's like i think this is right and then i come out I, my little critter comes out and um i'm trying oh. to do like the world world tour or whatever it's called and then like i'm like god dave that looks terrible (laughs) i look like some kind of homunculus it's so bad so like i i spent a lot of time trying to like trying the first time to get it and then like the second time i booted it up i'm like okay i have to try to fix it and now it's it's better um i have apparently been seeing like it's really hard unless you go with the default bodies to make a character that looks you know like like a human rather than some kind of <laughs> homunculus critter huh. so uh, that's probably part of the reason why people are are you know mid-maxing everything and making them look really wild so but of course like i don't have like a typical body shape let alone any of the presets that they've got so right and you gotta get I'm the making, sliders yeah and since i'm making my character look more like me like it's like okay i gotta mess around with this but yeah. 
still kind of dumpy on the on the lady character that looks kind of nah, mm. but that's okay anyway um i'll cover cover the avatar up with a bunch of clothes as soon as i can unlock <laughs> them um you can't so edit I, it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the inverse of uh every other online game <laughs> yeah it's not super beautified a thousand percent it's like it's it's like the elder scrolls problem <laughs> oh yeah so, so it's, it's not quite as bad as that but it's it's the elder scrolls problem so um yeah you can edit what they are wearing like you can go and get fashions and um depending upon where you're getting them if you buy fashion stuff from the battle hub which is like that uh online social area where you can spectate matches play other people uh, and, you know, fight against them um, in there. You can kind of hang out and take, you know, screenshot picture things and, and I don't know, some other stuff like that. It's more of a social area. You can go there and you can buy stuff, but it's just um, cosmetic. It doesn't actually affect any of your stats. Or if you're playing the world tour or whatever it's called, the, the mode where you have your little critter and you're running them around uh, through a bunch of different areas, learning under d- different masters to make your your fighting style unique to you that has moves inherited from a bunch of different characters. Uh, if you're going through that mode, you can give the character accessories that actually will up their strength, up their their kicking force or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. their defense. So, uh, you know, like there are stat boosts on those associated with those. So, hmm. yeah. And um, I, I spent a long time just wandering around. Like I, I went into the world tour mode and uh, you start out with Luke and he's like, yeah, I'm going to teach you the stuff, the, the whatever. And, uh, you know, you wander around in the city and, you know, you fight people, random people on the street, just anybody. Um <laughs> <laughs> and they all have different levels and like they they basically like tap your fist and they're like yeah everybody's happy to fight you and there's also thugs that have um cardboard boxes on their heads with little eye holes poked out and they're like you know hooligans that'll come and fight you and they will they're gang hiding up on you. from the yakuza uh cast <laughs> <Yeah>. right <laughs> just just cowering from kiryu well, and uh, they they will just like fight you on mass, and then you have like a whole bunch of them. Like a whole bunch of them jumped me, and I had I don't know like five or six, and they kept on jumping more. Like more of them kept on showing up on the screen. I'm like God, when are they going to be done with this? Yeah, you know. Um, I found a superhero on a roof who's just like standing heroically, and I forget what they called him some some kind of nonsense name, but he's like in a hero outfit, and he's just standing there on a rooftop, and you know he's like, "I am a hero. I am overlooking the city." <laughs> but if mm-hmm. you talk to him, he gives you a goodie, so that's cool. Yeah. Um, so like, there's a bunch of weird, random stuff in there that's uh, fun, and uh, the different people on the street have different fighting styles, so. You know, like apparently everybody trains under some master or another. And so, you know, different ones have different styles that you can uh, test your skills uh, against. What style, what style of character do you have? Do you, are you running? Uh, Well, you start out with only two moves of Luke's and like you can unlock as you continue to go more of his moves. And then each time you, you go unlock different characters as you go through that world tour mode, like the next one is Chun Li in Chinatown. I just got to her and I just unlocked some moves from her, but I haven't actually, you know, um, done anything else, you know, to get more skills to make it more of my own unique fighting style with a bunch of moves from different people. So Mm -hmm. right now I'm rolling with like two of Luke's moves and one of Chun-Li's and um, I still have to unlock another skill tier so that I can put another skill in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you can have uh, four ground skills and then four aerial moves and then you can do it like a special move. And depending upon what master you are assigning yourself to at the time like you can train up your um, style points with that particular master which unlocks additional skills and you know conversations and stuff with that master Mm -hmm. so basically you can pick a track like if you really hate chun li's fighting style you don't want to do her then you can just go through it for the story part and then just never choose her again you know yeah so So it's not like forcing you to use stuff you don't really want. So that's so cool. Is there any sort of 
I don't know, like competitive structure or something like that for the um, for the player made characters or the competitive modes only the I know canon characters for lack of a better term. I don't know yet because I'm not playing online with anybody at this point. I don't have like I I will eventually join the folks that got me the game um, in. I will, you know, link up with them and then ask them more questions about it actively. But like I had been kind of, again, sad panda in the corner. So I didn't really I was like, I don't know when I'm ever going to play this game. I don't want to read about it right now. I'll just be sad. Um, And so I didn't read anything that they were discussing about it. And (laughs) now that I've got it, like I have I have not gotten to a point to figure out if there is a competitive mode for the homunculus characters or not. Um, I, I don't know if like there's a place or if, or if people just like wander around in the world tour mode and you can just like, you know, invite them to have a match with you or anything, or I don't know. I, I have not figured that out yet. Um, but I will so far, the most time that I've spent has been in just the world world tour mode, messing with my little critter. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it's like weird and different, you know, like it, this is like kind of an RPG because you have your life bar and, you know, it's going down every time you get into a fight and you have items that you can use in a menu in the middle of your battle to boost your stats and stuff or to heal you. And then after battle, you can go to like food trucks and stuff and replenish your health. So, you know, it's got like RPG elements to it. Mm hmm. And of course, there's like a story and you can do like a skill tree. You can unlock different stuff to strengthen like your kicks or your punches or I want a discount at the market or whatever. And like, you know, there's a skill tree that you have to pick to move your way up as you gain levels. So, so, you know, I'm messing with that for now just because it's unique. Uh, I did run through arcade mode once with Cammy, and I have not played Street Fighter in so long. Like the first oh, yeah. time I pulled it up and then like also uh, I haven't played Street Fighter in a long time and I don't know these weirdos in this game. So, mm-hmm. you know, like I don't know what all of their moves are because I don't know who they are and everything oh, and, yeah. and how they play. So, you know, every single match is a surprise because <laughs> none of the people I fought were like any of the characters that I know from Street Fighter. So, um, you know, I ran through it, but it was fun because I'm like, oh my God, I can't get, I can't get used to this. What's the button for the X, Y, Z? Because like, you know, there's, there's stuff in this game that wasn't in prior games. Like, um, it's like an alternate super meter. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a different super meter, but then there's also, uh, different ways to do like different types of combos and doing like punishing punishment counters and all different kinds of stuff so like some of the stuff i'm like i actually really need to go back and look at my buttons um you know like look at the button mapping or look go at your back and what, do the look at your what i'm sorry the the button mapping uh, the what mapping buttons okay cool <laughs> so um I need to look at that again just to figure out what it's called and then like go do the tutorial on that again because like I ran through the tutorial the first time I booted it up but it was just such a long tutorial that I just it stuff fell out of my head and I'm like I don't know yeah, yeah. whatever no. I, Every- I retained <laughs> some of it <laughs> but um but yeah like uh I like Cammy uh I've always liked Cammy she's been kind of like one of my main characters that I play Street Fighter with uh, since her first appearance so it was fun to play her and um, I look forward to I'm gonna have to spend a lot of time just trying to figure out all the moves of all the different characters and see too if there's another character that I want to spend some time learning because as much as I like Cammy, it's like mm, you know I, I don't always want to play like a super anti-error kind of character like sometimes I want to play something else so you know, it's not always the matchup you need. Yeah. yeah, and it's not always the matchup I need. So, you know, I want to do a little bit of variety. Mm-hmm. So I got to do some some studying up on these characters and things. But yeah. that that is yet to come. I have been having a lot of fun with it, even just with uh, playing with my weird uh, homunculus character. <laughs> you know, my critter, if you will. So... Nice. I plan to challenge the superhero as soon as I can, but he's level 29 and I think I reach level 10. So okay. I have a while yet before I can fight him, but I'm going mm-hmm. to the moment I can. Nice. 
Well, anything let's hope, else? Let's hope he wasn't doing anything truly important because if he's dead, then the world will fall apart. He doesn't. They don't <laughs> die. They just keep walking down the street afterwards. This, They're cool. This one does. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real turn. <laughs> right, right. Nice. Anything else about that that anybody have questions of? No. no? Okay. The other six. Resident Evil 6. Yes, I'm playing Resident Evil 6 again. Mm-hmm. I kind of figure you're always at least partway through one playthrough of that or another I with somebody. Had, I had been partway through a playthrough of that with somebody, and I don't remember who it was, but the last time I played it was like a few years ago. So uh, I did a fresh start again, this time with Nick, and I, I'm halfway through Leon and Helena's campaign with Nick, mm-hmm. and... Yeah, I, I was just streaming it on my Discord server, and then Adam Bucheri popped in and asked me how it felt to play after having played Resident Evil 4 Remake, and I felt like this would be a really good thing to bring to the show and chat about, since it's mostly mechanics and presentational stuff. There's, like, no spoiler-involved things. Yeah. So uh, right. I mean, <laughs> it, it would be spoilers for a for an 18-year-old <laughs> and a, uh, let's say, 12-year-old game, respectively. I think we're good. <laughs> yeah but i mean like talking remake although like honestly that when i started comparing it to stuff i'm like comparing it to og resident evil 4 and also resident evil 4 remake i'm I'm not talking about like every resident evil i'm just talking yeah, those because yeah. those are like you know in recent conversation oh oh yeah no and uh, and, and, and and by the 18 and the 11 i'm i'm talking about re4 yeah, original they, and, yeah. and and uh, you know and and six yeah oh, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so like, go, go, go into it kind of like, what's your thesis and the comparison between these? Well, I've got a lot of different things and I was kind of just starting with literally the beginning of six because, mm-hmm. you know, I was thinking through it and, you know, once you gain control of your character after the initial cutscene, you can't immediately use the entire verb set. You're walking slow. The camera is sometimes fixing itself to a point. Uh, your characters are really limited. Your actions are limited. And this they're doing this because they are setting the mood. It's the beginning. It's one of the few places in the game that leans into horror and the controls, the camera work and the enemy AI don't on their own present a level of tension that you get from like 4R. So instead of using the environmental storytelling and like the sound design and stuff to make it creepy, instead it's like, you know, just controlling stuff and taking stuff away from you, which doesn't feel great. I mean, it's, it's really annoying actually, especially if you played it as many hours as I have. So, um, you know, like that was like, hmm, I'm not a big fan of this. Now, some of the lighting and stuff in the beginning is still really cool. Some of the the camera work when they, you know, put it um, focused at stuff like the lightning flashing in the windows with the, you know, drapes billowing or whatever, like, and the balloons falling on the floor. Like, that's really cool. But Mm -hmm. at the same time, it's like. You know, you could have done that and also not jerked away all the control from me at the same time. You know, yeah. uh, they're just they're trying to like give you a taste of something that they're going to stringently deny you for the rest of the, you know, 16 hours that you are playing this game. And that's which what is led, atmosphere that, and mood. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what led me to think, OK, so what actually were the points in Resident Evil 6 that are sort of horror ish? So. Most of them are from Leon's campaign. There's the beginning of Leon's campaign in the town. That's hectic. Mm -hmm. That's frantic. It's scary. They do the, you know, tension music and, you know, just a lot of wild stuff going on. There's the lab sequence where you find out what happened to Deborah. And Mm -hmm. Dave says, okay, that's really like all of that is just horror movie stuff. Uh, The Chinese market with the regenerators. That one is very horror. Mm -hmm. Uh, When the gas hits China and you're in the Humvee with the dramatic music and the ash floating and stuff like that's really traumatic. The snake mm-hmm. level with your men taken out one by one when you're playing Chris and Piers, the part where Ustanak is rising out of the lava and grabs onto the sled where Jake and Sherry are barely holding on. And like the fight between Ada and the chainsaw critter on the train. Those are like yeah. the only ones I can, and there's like one per other um, campaign other than Leon's, which has like four. I forget which campaign has the, um, the 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 docks with the chainsaw guys. The docks with the chainsaw guys is going to be Jake and Sherry. Gotcha. I remember that being 
uh, like pretty, I don't know. <laughs> it's so hard to say scary because that is such an unfungible term, but like, let's say um, startling and tense. Yeah. Well, especially yeah. when they're under the water, that was pretty cool when they're all lit up yeah, and under the yeah. water. Yeah, and stuff. The, the graphics, at least for that, are pretty awesome. Yeah. 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 So so let's talk about some other things. So enemy AI is a lot tighter and more responsive in Resident Evil 4 Remake, of course. Yeah. Uh, the way that they attempt to create pressure in 6 is so different than 4 or 4R because... It's numbers. In, in 6, it is, yeah, you're, it's areas where you're forced to split off from your partner that creates tension or fighting armored enemies or from infinite spawn zombies or Joavo, and that's it. And when you're split off from your companion and you each have asymmetrical activities, that's effective in, you know, in the regard of making tension because, uh, you know, like you and your partner can't talk it out, you know, like you're, you're doing yeah, different stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it can also be really frustrating if your partner keeps failing and thus killing you in the process. So depending upon yeah. the level of skill of the player or the AI and then Infinispawn, at least in this instance, I, I can't speak for every instance because the moment I do, somebody's going to be like, well, actually, and at me on Twitter, don't at me. Um, <laughs> Infinispawn. Don't at me, bro. <laughs> Infinispawn feels sloppy. It's sloppy difficulty ramping and difficult, you know, sloppy pushing you forward, like getting the momentum going by making you go because there's so many stuff, you know, so many things coming after you. And that's just. That's that's like artificial pacing. It's it's not great. So if somebody skipped playing five and went from OG Resident Evil four to six, I could see why they would hate it if they feel married to what Capcom is doing in four, because while four is a horror action game, six is an action game with some horror set dressing. And some of the core design elements feel lazy when they're reined in when they reined everything in so well in four. So yeah. The gameplay cuts away to cutscenes a lot mm-hmm. uh, with an embarrassment of QTE sequences. So yeah. uh, there's also no accessibility options for the QTEs. You just have to mash buttons or time it yes. or whatever you're doing. So the lack of accessibility sucks. Uh, the HUD changing for each campaign is fun, but the quick toggle for weapons and items, which I absolutely loved before, uh, actually seems clumsy now because in Resident Evil 4 Remake, you have assignable mapping so you mm-hmm. don't accidentally pull the magnum when you meant to use the AR. Yes. Mm. It's actually like a really, really good system in mm-hmm. RE2. I mean, because they pull it from, I mean, I forget if seven had the two layers of uh, hotkeys on there, but it was definitely an eight. Yeah. 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 And that, that uh, mapping. And again, like I'm, even though I played eight, I'm really only just talking like four and four R because that was the prompt yeah, what yeah. was given to me. And I was like, Oh, but that's also the one that's in current, you know, discussion. So, mm-hmm. uh, so anyway, there's also some predetermined items, but the item drops otherwise feel really randomized rather than responsive to your play style and your needs, which is, you know, responsive item drops are a four and four R thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, As this is an action game, you get a lot more explosives and you get skill points rather than currency currency. So your upgrades are via your skill unlocks rather than upgrading your weapons. So like your skill unlocks are like lock on rock steady defense. And those are things that you have to unlock and then equip and you can only have three set up at a time. And Mm -hmm. um, that's how they do it rather than having your weapons unlock uh, new upgrades and things. So each character starts with a slightly different handgun and a secondary weapon, which varies like a shotgun for Helena, a sniper rifle for peers. But from there, both of the characters in each of the different campaigns acquire the same gun. So by the end of the game, you have weapon bloat where in four and four R they force you to make decisions about what you want to keep on your, you know, in your case, although four R happens to have like a storage unit that you can use for weapons and first aid sprays that is tied to your typewriter so Mm -hmm. you can actually store stuff if you don't want to have it in your current kit but you might want it the next chapter so um yeah there's also like a lot of dialogue between leon and helena for example since i'm in the middle of that campaign but they lack completely lack the chemistry of leon and ashley but that's partially i hate helena I've never uh, liked that character. <laughs> she's she's very she has no character. She, yeah. she 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 is quite bland. Like they give her, 
<laughs> it's so weird because like it, the more common scenario is a character who has like a lot of traits but no no motivation yeah and helena she has no traits but she is just driven by revenge yeah and like i don't know both of those are unsatisfying but like i don't know you bring you ask anybody to br- <laughs> to bring up their even like top 5 favorite resident evil characters they will forget that helena even exists yeah yeah, absolutely. I, I also mean, even top five characters in Resident Evil Six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. So um, I would also say that Chris and Piers also lack chemistry for the first half because Chris is in such a PTSD roid rage that like he can't be a character for like half of that campaign. And so the only campaign that actually has really fun dialogue, legitimately fun interchanges with each other is the Jake and Sherry one. Oh, yeah. Jake and Sherry, like that campaign is really good. Yeah. 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 And also, I just wanted to comment, like the villains in five and six both fail to be as fun as the villains in four. And I mean, four OG, not remake, because I actually tone stuff down. Wait, wait, no, four, four does not have a dude surfing on lava, though. Oh, oh, you're you're talking about five, or is somebody in does somebody in six surf on lava? Ustanak, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. He comes the, back the, out the, Terminator think style. about it. We're <laughs> all surfing on lava. Right yeah. Now. The, <laughs> the, the, the dude who's following you throughout the entire campaign. Yeah, the Ustanak. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, some of the boss fights, though, I will say some of the boss fights in six are neat. Like the Levotitsa fights in the church and the airplane are both really good. Like whenever that that titty monster shows up, it's Mm -hmm. it's, I can't say whenever the titty monster shows up, it's a good time. But whenever the titty monster (laughs) shows up, it's a good time. Uh, Yeah, yeah. The invisible snake fight is fun because it's just different than everything else that they're doing. Uh, the dual Gigante fight with the chainsaw or the chain guns and the hectic swarms of Infinispawn enemies. Like as much as that's Infinispawn and I don't like that, it serves a pretty good function there. And I like the way it works yeah. there. Uh, and then the Ustanak fight in the ice cave was <laughs> really fun for me. And they also have some neat sequences like sneaking through the town of rampaging zombies and the Chinese market and the snake level and the Ustanak ice cave sneaking level. And even the underwater lab is a cool environment. Although some of the worst QTEs are there. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like the, the, the QTE thing. This was something that really stood out um, in talking about the RE4 remake for WAF, which is just a blanket removal of QTEs, force them to fill in those beats uh, with stuff that is way more interesting. Yeah. I'm thinking of, you know, the um, uh, knife fight against um, Krauser, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like Ashley's whole chapter alone, like they had to change it entirely, but that's just because they couldn't just make it a big, you know, just like, uh, okay, you want to take a step reflex test. You want to take a step reflex test. Like Mm -hmm. it was, it was just a positive that they removed that. Yeah, absolutely. So I will say though, that with, uh, RE six, the minute to minute actual gameplay still feels robust. It -hmm. remains a solid improvement over five in terms of streamlining the controls and melee is still hella fun with a bunch of multiple attacks and takedowns relevant to your positioning and the circumstances. Like, is there a knife in the zombies chest (laughs) health of the enemy, uh, during some of these parts, the animation of the animation, when you're doing your melee attacks, you have hit priority as well. So you can, depending on your timing, if you're really good with timing, you can do some really cool stuff. Yeah. And you have knockdowns and stuns of various stages, depending on your weapon, the target, etc. You can recover mid stagger by holding the sprint button. There is a large number of deadly combos that you can perform too. So like, there's a lot of different stuff that they have built into the melee that, and uh, you know, just like the combat system in general, that is fun and cool. Um, and it really shows itself as being like a stepping stone for where they ended up going with the more action style gameplay, Mm -hmm. you know, like I still appreciate the game for what it is, but also going back to it after, you know, like all of the different iterations they've done since is just Mm -hmm. like, wow, it's an old game, you know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's been a few years since I played it last. So. 
I'm really happy that this network can continue to be the one place where people who think, hey, RE6 isn't that bad, they can come here for comfort. You are not alone, <laughs> actually. <laughs> like, it's not as good as 4 or for or 4 Remake, but like... Nobody should wish it out of existence. There are literally <laughs> dozens of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, like that's all I've really got for just broader commentary, at least at this point, insofar as, you know, comparison of 6 to 4 or 4R, um, since I played those recently uh, as well. And I've actually played them more recently than I played 6. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, like, um, I, I definitely noticed and it was very apparent to me when i was going through 4r just how much it leaned on stuff that they had learned from the action elements that you know they had done in previous games and you know again some of those animations from 4r are just it looks like they are lifted 100 percent out of six so mm-hmm. it's pretty wild yeah, I mean, Leon's four fighting style and Jake's fighting style in RE6 are very similar, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and some of the enemy animations, too. But mm-hmm. anyway, I digress. So that is all I've got on that. Anyone nice. have any questions about this very old game that is like a legal adult now? <laughs> re6 can finally it, drink with chris at the beginning of re6 <laughs> <laughs> yeah is it registered to vote <laughs> <laughs> yes but it's libertarian right uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh nice it's fun to think about six again yeah who's got um, something dennis since you've been doing cool table stuff tabletop stuff i want to hear about tabletop stuff yeah, I have been doing cool tabletop stuff. Um, specifically, I got to play Band of Blades uh, as a one shot while I was at Origins. Um, so are you guys familiar at all with Blades in the Dark? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, for anyone for anyone listening who, who hasn't heard of it before, is only passingly familiar. Uh, it is a tabletop role playing game system um, that has a, a, a really cool um atmosphere and and premise uh and and some cool mechanics as well so it's like um, a you city, are, city of thieves kind of thing exactly yeah, yeah. i mean it, it's dishonored the tabletop system essentially yeah. um you know you are these thieves in a uh grim dark kind of city um literally surrounded by ectoplasm walls keeping out ghosts or some such nonsense or keeping um, the man or keeping them in. That's right. <laughs> um, but the you know, the cool thing going on mechanically is, you know, you, you have your different skills and and, and uh, traits, um, but you can use literally any skill for any role. Uh, you just have to describe to the the GM how it applies. Yeah. Um, and then the the GM will respond by saying, "Okay, you can roll that. Um, here's how risky it's going to be." Um, and here's how effective it's going to be. And then you have a bunch of verbs to like, you know, make it more or less risky uh, and make it more or less effective Mm -hmm. depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So, um, really allows you to come at problems in your own way, um, in in a very fun system. So, um, band of blades is, I I guess it's technically a, a different system built on top of blades in the dark. Mm hmm. Um, it tells the story like every, every, um, campaign of band of blades is, is the same story. You just go through it different ways. Um, you always start as part of this elite, uh, army called the Legion that holds back the, uh, you know, holds back the darkness for this world. Uh, it's set in kind of like a medieval plus muskets, uh, you know, medieval plus gunpowder world. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, AKA Ravenloft. Yeah, kind of, kind of. It's got that vibe. Um, and, and, you know, with, with zombies um, and, uh, you know, avatars of the gods wandering around. Um, but anyway, you, you know, your fighting force has protected the world throughout the ages. Uh, and it's never broken before. And the campaign starts um, where, at a, a crucial battle where the Legion is soundly defeated. Um, and you are given this like priceless artifact that is central to who the Legion is and told to run. <laughs> um, and so your, your squad of, of players 
is making their way across um, the country uh, to this keep to make a final stand for the Legion. To like, there's there's one last place now that it's all gone to hell um, that we might be able to hole up and make it through and not be completely wiped out. And that's what you're making your way towards. Hmm. Um, so really cool story. And, and at first when I heard like, oh, it's always this one path, I was like, eh, like really? That's, that's kind of weird. And then I found out this game is XCOM. Uh-oh. <laughs> this this Wait, is so XCOM. you mean that everyone specs sniper? Uh, potentially. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I mean, like, I associate uh, Blades in the Dark with being kind of rules light, like more of a storytelling, yeah, know, kind of, yeah, kind of deal. Like when you say, "Oh, this is XCOM," suddenly we're in like an Iron Kingdom kind of thing. Like, yeah, we're we're leaning toward like a tactical combat kind of deal. So I'm completely thrown for a loop here. Less so on. So you know how like um, XCOM has the tactical layer and the base building layer. Okay. Yeah. So it is like Blades in the Dark in the tactical layer. And then XCOM in the the base building squad management layer. Okay. So, um, you, so you're spending resources to get kind of like long term advantages over the course of the uh, the same story that you run, mm-hmm. and, and making and making tough decisions against overwhelming odds, um, and specifically the way the squads work is very XCOM, because uh, now I I played only one character because this was a one shot, but over the course of a campaign. Uh, like an individual player at the table will play more than one character. And at the beginning of every mission, every excursion that you're sent on, uh, you choose who you're going to take. Mm -hmm. Um, Now that is always, uh, you know, a a squad is always going. It will always contain, uh, I think at least two rookies. Um, And and rookies, as you can imagine, are, are less powerful um, I guess you, you always have a squad of five rookies with you. Uh, excuse me, I remember now. You always have a f- squad of five rookies with you, and players can choose to be those rookies. But rookies will only ever have the chance to be promoted if a player plays as a rookie. Okay. Um, so the character, you know, the, it is a, a less powerful character, but they have some special abilities as rookies um, that are that are unique. Um, and the only way to get those uh, abilities and to have them on a character is to have a rookie survive and get promoted up through the ranks. Oh, that is so high stakes. Yeah. Yes. And so that's your incentive for going in underpowered is like, if I can get this guy to survive, then I can build him into whatever class and he's still going to have these unique perks from being a rookie. So like between battles, is there something that keeps them out of commission? Because like, I don't know, I think of XCOM campaign and the thing that forces you to rotate through your stock by stock. Mm -hmm. I mean, human (laughs) beings with dreams. I think I saw one write a song um, uh, is, um, uh, you know, the fact that they get injured, you know, for a certain amount and they've got Mm -hmm. like a recovery time. Like, are people like right back in them? Like, is there a downside to like bringing this rookie in and then just like getting them like limped across the finish line? Like I got all of them across, even if he wasn't in one part (laughs) in one piece kind of thing. Yeah. Well, no, I mean that, that is the, and they explicitly say like, all right, you know, if you're if you're a um, a specialist, I think they call the ones that have been promoted up. If you're a specialist, your job is to accomplish the mission. If mm-hmm. you're a rookie, your job is to survive. Okay, and that's literally like your success for you on this mission. You know, uh, Blades in the Dark. Another thing that it does is like between uh, scores, if you're playing Blades in the Dark, or between excursions, if you're playing Band of Blades. Um, the way you gain experience as you debrief the mission is you ask a series of questions related to your character and their background. Mm -hmm. Um, And those questions are different based on, on the class. Like if you're playing a brawler, one of the questions might be like, did you uh, solve a problem with brute force? Mm. And if the answer is yes, you get an experience point, you know? And so it it truly is. You level up by role playing your character for the rookie. It's basically like, are you alive right now? (laughs) Yeah. And and that's enough for the rookie. They just hold a mirror up to his mouth to see if he fogs it. Yeah, <laughs> basically. I mean, um, is there an option for no, but I'm a zombie now? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I would not be surprised if that was in the campaign somewhere. Uh, didn't specifically happen to us, but I, I would believe it. 
Um, the other interesting thing is, like I said, you always have a squad of five rookies. And as the specialist, you can kind of like direct those squads and, and have them do things. And um, part of the combat or an added wrinkle to the combat um, that's specifically in uh, Band of Blades is your, your um, oh, what do they call it? It's like your force or your your quantity, essentially, but quantity is the wrong word. Mm-hmm. Um, the, si- the size of your force, your fighters, um, impacts how successful you can be. Mm-hmm. And so having the rookies, like assigning them to go with you, even though they're not going to be super helpful, um, gives you advantages because now you've got at least four people firing on the target instead of one or, or what have you. Uh, player controlled rookies, uh, if they take damage, you know, they, they have, um, you know, health. Uh, non-player controlled rookies, if they take any damage whatsoever, they just die. No oh, God. So it's like you go into every mission knowing that probably a couple rookies are going to die. Yeah. They're going to get redshirted. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, exactly. don't, I don't mean playing past senior year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, do you, they, they uh, they so do you do the whole like, Oh yeah, I, I'm not going to bother to learn your name. <laughs> oh no. Well, the, the RGM made sure that we knew every single one of their <laughs> names and every single one had a personality. <laughs> Oh, they, um, <laughs> the Last of Us Two, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was Yelena. I can, I can spit them right back out, guys. There was <laughs> Yelena. Um, she was like really, really good hearted. And actually, we we were in a situation where like we needed to run, but we realized there were civilians uh, stuck in this church. Um, we kind of decided not to help them um, as much as we could have. Maybe um, Yelena, Yelena almost less, left us over that. She's very like, we got to protect everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, there was uh, two feather who was, uh, he, he said maybe uh, two words uh, the entire campaign. Um, but you know, was, was leading us and he's very, very sneaky. Um, he patted me on the back at the end of the mission. And, and that was the most affection he'd ever shown. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, so like yeah all these rookies are are you know depending on the gm very well fleshed out uh and you you feel the weight of it when it's like okay um like if i don't want them to take harm and they can't take any or they die i need to take it myself uh, no. and that that adds up real real quick now does does this uh game support campaign play at all yeah, so the the idea is that you are going through that consistent campaign, like I mentioned at the start. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when I say campaign c- game, I mean like playing indefinitely with the same characters. No, no, specifically not. And then again, I thought that was so weird. I kind of see how it works now. Basically, you you know, you get to the end, you have your final last stand, and if you want to keep on playing, you just like start a new campaign from a similar spot, uh, or for you know from the beginning. Uh, which is, yeah, it's a weird hybrid of like, you know, feels anathema to TTRPGs, honestly. Um, Although, yeah, that's that's actually been my long term complaint uh, with the uh, Blades in the Dark games is that they traditionally haven't supported that. Uh, indefinite play. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's like, you know, in Blades in the Dark, your character is going to accrue traumas and and stuff you know bad things over time that eventually like they're going to die or you're going to have to retire them because if you go out on one more score you're going to die right um and and you know hopefully you have earned enough money in that time to uh, allow them a a happy retirement as it were um as happy as one can be in a a city filled with ghosts uh but i'm I'm crossing back over into that just sounds awesome yeah filled filled with ghosts (laughs) or surrounded by ghosts Mm hmm. Yep. We're, we're going to keep on hammering that. It, it is also a city where the only food available is mushroom based. So <laughs> yeah, no, that, that would be unless, hell. Unless you get a real no. thing for fungus, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. But yeah, so it, um, the GM said that, you know, and he, he was very experienced with the game. Um, you know, he, he loves running it because it is, you know, you, you say to someone, Hey, you want to join my campaign? And they're like, uh, you know, do I, do I want to be, committed to hanging out with you weekly or more for the next 10 years like hmm this takes the pressure off it's like look we're going to start at point a we're going to end at point b and then we can we can do it again we can do something else or i can just never see you again like you know that that it feels like a much more manageable commitment and it feels good to just kind of like try getting a group together to then do something more permanent nice 
Um, but yeah, so really, really cool system, really cool ideas. Again, I love the XCOM elements from a, a squad management standpoint. Um, there was more XCOM style things uh, at that tactical, or excuse me, at that uh, base building layer that I didn't really get to interact with because it, you know we we did a one, one shot. shot instead of a yeah. campaign. Um, but basically, like you have to decide how to allocate resources between your squads, and so like you have two missions that you're going to run uh, for one mission. You're going to have guns and for the other, you're not, which one would you like to you know, be equipped for? Uh, so like those, those kind of decisions are really cool. And, and I think it makes it so, um, you know, every time you sit down at the table playing through this campaign, you can be doing something radically different. You're not married um, to that character and that character's play style indefinitely while still getting the cool aspects of like, Hey, I, I know this person, this, there's a personality here. There's story here, um, that you can, you can mess around with. Hmm. So Neat. yeah, that was, that was a uh, band of blades. Apparently it's out of print, so y- you can't buy it right now. If you see it mm-hmm. in a store somewhere, uh, snap it right up because, I, uh, uh, yeah, I see fifty in stock on the on the book oh, no way. on the website. Yeah, yeah, no. Mm, okay, yeah, so now book, I'm pissed. Book, book and PDF for forty five bucks. Yeah. Okay. Um, the I I went to it, it's through like uh it was an indie print revolution or or whatever that publisher is same same people that do blades in the dark. Mm-hmm. I went to their booth at Origins and I said, hey, do you have do you have band of blades at the table? Because I I at least wanted to look through the book uh and and you know might have picked it up. <laughs> And she's like, yeah, no, it's out of print. So like if you if you see it, get it, but you can't you can't oh. get it here anywhere. So oh. filthy liars. Oh, I mean, think maybe they were working with the information they had. Yeah, that's that's probably more likely. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm amped up because my adrenaline is going from being in these missions, you know, where mm-hmm. anyone can die at any time. Yeah. Uh, my my character as an aside, uh, it was very fun. Uh his name was um Gabridor Zoyahov. We called him Gabrador the Labrador. The, um, and he was like, he was basically, you know, a giant brute. He was Kronk from Emperor's New Groove, essentially. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, swallowed every piece of propaganda, hook, line, and sinker that he had ever heard about the Legion and mm-hmm. um, was very, uh, very like, yeah, right, let's do it and crashed through uh, walls, etc. cetera, with, with no thought. Mm <laughs> hmm. Um, that was that was fun to play, you know. Stir some shit for the rest of the party that was trying to think think tactically. Nice. Uh, actually, that that kind of transitions nicely to the next thing I've been playing. Okay. Um, I so that yeah that was that was uh, Band of Blades. Uh, I also have started playing in my first ever D and D five E campaign. Ooh. Ooh. So I've you know I've I've done uh, TTRPGs before, one shot, done some campaign stuff. Um, I've never actually played the big, uh, Walmart of TTRPGs, mm-hmm. Dungeons and Dragons. So I, I finally, uh, found a group. They were looking for someone to jump in and I did. Um, it's been a blast so far. Uh, but the character I'm playing is a forest gnome druid named weird good. Uh, and the story is that this gnome uh, you know, grew up in a circle of druids that really put the dirty in dirty hippies. Okay. They're swamp druids. Uh, <laughs> and his, his like eccentricity, eccentricity was considered a virtue uh, in, in that circle. And uh, many were kind of thinking of him as, as probably the next in line to lead. Uh, oh. But before that could happen, an awful something, uh, haven't, haven't figured out what that is, but an oh. awful something <laughs> wiped out his circle of druids and dried up his swamp. Oh no. Um, so yeah, God. so he, he kind of wandered out into the world uh, with more survivor's guilt than sanity um, and, and kind of started exploring. Um, T- I mean, doesn't- I'm going to, I'm going to ask it to cut to a chase here. Tell me he is some kind of gator mancer. <laughs> yes please i might i might know his his first creature that he summoned was a weasel okay um and and i've i've decided the group doesn't know this yet and i don't i don't know if they listen or not um but uh you know they, they they're like oh what's the weasel's name i'm like weasel duh um <laughs> and so now everything i summon is going to be weasel oh yeah <laughs> so I'm gonna summon a spider named weasel um i'm doing a stitch voice for uh for him which is very okay. fun um, I don't care if they think it's annoying or not. I think it's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he just, you know, has, has no no respect for personal space, no understanding of uh, conventional customs. He's he's right out of the swamp, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and having a lot of fun with that. So, uh, 
you know, I cast guidance on someone by smacking their ass. Like, get in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that sort of thing. Uh, it's it's very fun to kind of be the, the zany character to, again, uh, stir some shit for the the otherwise fairly serious adventuring party. Gotcha. There, there's only room for one of those characters in a party. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was happy to step into that slot and it's, it's been well received as far as I can tell. Did you step into a campaign that was already in progress or uh, did everybody kind of start anew? Uh, I stepped into a campaign um, that was like two sessions in. So people were level two. Um, they had had a player that needed to drop. Um, I, I kind of had this character idea from some other messing around I'd done um, and was like, oh, I, I have an idea for like a gnome druid. And they're like, oh, that's perfect. The other person was playing a gnome. Hmm. Like, we'll we'll swap it right out. So <laughs> it didn't even have to change their, <laughs> their mental concept. Out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of, they kind of all like, all right, mentally, instead of this gnome artificer, we're going to imagine we were with this gnome druid mm-hmm. uh, the entire time. Uh, and, and I, you know, they'd only played once or twice before. So that, that uh, wasn't a hard transition to make. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh that's been a blast. It's nice to have like a regular um, uh, campaign TTRPG wise to, mm-hmm. to play in. Are you playing um, this in person or is it um, over like a no, service? No, it's, it's on roll 20. Uh, gotcha. Unfortunately, I would love to game in person. It just, uh, no, man, it's, it's, a, it's impossible to, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so maybe, maybe at some point, but definitely not right now. Um, but yeah, I've, I, I, I tell you what, <laughs> it, it is nice having roll 20, just do all the math for oh, you. Oh yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I really, really, uh, don't I knowing how easy it is online mm-hmm. um, while all the benefits of socially uh, being in person would suck some of the joy out of being in person for the, me. The first time a wizard above level six casts fireball, uh, you will, <laughs> I mean, you will curse every single first off. They're going to take every mm-hmm. uh, uh, D6 from everybody at the table to do it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I just read. I remember David playing with Kyle mm-hmm. and just it's like, all right, so guys, we've got to pull our D6s to get this fireball out. <laughs> Come on, uh, we're on a deadline. We've got to get this fireball out the door. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. Uh, I, I don't know how much damage I rolled. The table collapsed under the weight of the dice. Yes. Uh, is that a second <laughs> roll when they hit the floor? Yeah. Oh, that's good. And is that considered an advantage or disadvantage? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, having, having a good time with that. Um, yeah, I, I imagine there will be periodic updates from that uh, as, as particularly interesting things happen. Um, I got infected with some kind of fungus that's having mushrooms grow on my nose. Um, Perfectly I, appropriate for a swamp person. Yeah, yeah, totally. If he if he picks all of them off, then they double. So like there was one, I picked it off and two sprouted. So I picked mm. those off and then four sprouted. And then I picked all but one off and nothing happened. And then that one got picked off later and eight sprouted. I've had um, that nightmare before. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, weird good is insisting to the party that he doesn't need help and it's just boogers because <laughs> in his mind, his mind, that's better. That's perfectly acceptable. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I just got, I'm just flicking boogers off guys. Uh, and, oh. and uh, we'll see where that goes. Gross. Um, but yeah. Fun, <laughs> fun. Yeah. Fun, gross uh, stitch slash golem character to play. Hmm. Yeah. D and D finally. Mm hmm. Uh, that's that's my tabletop play. I've I've been continuing to play Diablo Four. Uh, that game slaps. It is an excellent podcast game. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, not not a ton new to say about it. Um, it is always a nice feeling when you get one of those like rare or unique or legendary whatever drops. That is you know the special ability doubles the power of a skill you're already using mm-hmm. uh, or something to that effect. Um, so there's always that little slot machine going in the background as you're as you're crushing through dungeons yeah um but yeah uh that's uh that's a game that uh, has been fun and has been fun with friends and i i I might be able to use that to alley-oop over to david i don't know maybe i was gonna go to david anyway uh david how about you yeah so i've been playing uh diablo funny how that happened (laughs) (laughs) we didn't plan that it's just Uh, probability Exactly, exactly. We we only uh, use probabilistic uh, transitions. Uh, yeah, so I've completed um, Act 1, 
and I'm, I think, well on my way to uh, finishing Act 2. I've There's a place fairly early on where it branches, and in the you know, two missions you have to complete, and I beat both of those missions. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I'm right at the end of Act 2. Um, man, this, this is a game that's really hard to, uh, you know, say a lot about because it's very much a, the gameplay is the experience, if that makes sense. What, uh, do you have like highlights from the build that you have in mind? Or are you still in the mode of just grabbing whatever the highest number equipment is? Um, you know, I'm not doing a ton, uh, with the actual equipment build at this point. Um, partially just because it's not exactly worth it to me before I get to end game. Um, I'm, I'm going with a flurry rogue, which is the rogue ability that basically lets you kind of do a multi-attack everything in an arc in front of you, you attack with um, my most of my damage output coming from poison abilities. Very cool. Um, yeah, the I think probably the interest, most interesting thing is that I'm not using a I'm not using an ultimate at all on this build. Uh, well, so, how does that work? It's your ultimate. Yeah, but I mean, there's not enough uh you know rose on the on the hotkey bar for it <laughs> for, for your most powerful ability <laughs> i mean is it really your most powerful ability definitionally I, I, yeah <laughs> it's, i don't know it's, it's not your penultimate <laughs> <laughs> yeah no um the thing is and this is something that's actually kind of weird to me in terms of how they decide to um design this you only have enough buttons or you know slots effectively for one of each type of ability and so i'm doubling up on i'm using both the uh it's called like uh dark shroud which is basically damage reduction and uh, poison trap and so that means something else has to go and I don't know. None of the ultimates for the rogue are really all that exciting. Yeah, I mean, so that that's a problem for the necromancer, which uh, which is the class I'm playing as well, because one of your slots has to be dedicated to summoning summoning right. your skeletons, right? Mm. Which is so I I actually have a, a a node of my skill tree that I just am not using at all, um, so that I can fit both that and my ultimate onto my my bar so it it is odd that they they kind of built into the design are are shorting you a slot that is that is definitely annoying Uh, i'm I'm just surprised that the the ability that got shorted on your end was the ultimate yeah i yeah it's weird i think part of it is so i i don't know i i would say my biggest um complaint overall with um um, I want to say Resident Evil 4, um, Diablo 4, <laughs> is the fact that the characters aren't, the characters' um, available abilities aren't very wide. So, like, you know, at, at the ability tier where you get a trap, there is only one trap you can get. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, whereas, like, Diablo 2, it's like, do you want fire traps or electric traps or blade traps? This is just like poison trap is, is the trap that exists. And so the problem with that is once it gets to the ultimates, it's, you know, if that specific thing in, you know, there's kind of one ultimate for each of the broad type of abilities you have. Mm -hmm. And, um, if it just happens not to fit with your build, then, you know, you know, then you don't have an ultimate. So Mm -hmm. sorry um, about you. Right. So for example, in my case, um, you know, probably what I would go with 
is um, the trap ability. But since it's not poison damage, and that's what all of my build is built around maximizing, it's kind of useless. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that that makes sense. And I, I guess the one thing that makes that forgivable, because I, I agree, super annoying, um, is respecking is fairly painless oh, in yeah. the game. Um, you know, other than the time spent puzzling out, you know, what skills to drop and what skills to add. Um, I, I haven't heard anyone that's actually le- ran into a resource barrier to respect. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, you know, my hope is I'm going to keep experimenting with it. I'm hoping as the seasons come around and the, um, uh, you know, expansions and stuff like that, I guess I don't know what the opposite of dumbing down is. I guess smart up. So I hope they smart up the game a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. You know, actually, Rogue is one of them I think could use some help. I think probably the biggest one is the Druid, uh, just because it's so strongly, um, you know, most people are going to spec into one of the uh, one of the forms you can shapeshift into, and mm-hmm. so for each of your abilities, there's usually literally only one ability for that form Mm. so yeah you know yeah so like if you're a werewolf druid you literally are identical to every other werewolf unit uh uh spec that's too bad yeah it's it's if you're trying to role play the the version of your character you have very few opportunities to customize so yeah, yeah, that's that's probably my uh my biggest um complaint so far, honestly. Um, you know, so far the game itself uh seems pretty good. I've been I've been enjoying the story. I think my um only complaint with the story so far is just that it doesn't seem to have any connection to any of the previous games. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I was reading about this. Uh, apparently, people were like, "No, no, um, go read a synopsis of um, Reaper of Souls, the expansion for Diablo 3. Like, there's a lot in there that sets this up. But it's like that was how many years ago? Yeah, um, right. I, and I, I that also be... was like a midling expansion for a midling game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, yeah, those looking for story are, are going to have to dig to to get all the setups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we uh we are almost to the first season, so that's going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm still hoping they cave on making you create a new character to participate in the season. Yeah, there's still time. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's I, also like if if you're thinking of Diablo as an MMO, yes, it like that. It seems very frustrating. To, to have to create a new character. If you're thinking of it as, um, I guess, an ARPG, uh, that seems to be a bit more in the formula. Yeah. Like, you'd, you'd be hard-pressed to find an ARPG that doesn't um, have elements of, like, all right, we're going to, you know, a season or, or uh, I think they called them ladders before, whatever I mean, you want to call it. Diablo, like, Diablo 2. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> No, notably Path of Exile and um, and Last Epoch both both do that same yeah. thing. I I think the the problem with that though is that this game is basically what if we made Diablo an MMO in terms of almost all the um, gameplay decisions are towards making the game more similar to how MMOs play. Mm. So like you know. As the example, with the very rigidly defined kind of cookie cutter abilities, they're very MMO style. Yeah. But, hmm. but yeah, no, I mean it's gonna be interesting to see uh what they uh what they do with that. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yep, yep. So but yeah, yeah, so so far it's uh it's pretty good. I do feel like at some point, you would think my character would realize, like, hey, instead of just, you know, constantly chasing Lilith's tail, why don't I skip to le- this, you know, 
thing I have marked in my guidebook as, you know, act three, and maybe I can get there before her. (laughs) (laughs) It's a, it's, it's not plot armor. It's uh, it's plot sequencing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'm interested to see, I'm sure someone is eventually going to play the game backwards. And I really look forward to seeing that. The uncomfortable truths that are revealed. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Namely that they never thought someone (laughs) or they never thought to design it. So it makes sense if you play it backwards. Mm. That that reminds me of the uh, most recent ghost recon game was completely open world. So you could go straight to, um, uh, straight to the final boss, which I did. (laughs) And uh, which resulted in a cutscene where my character like screams at him for all these horrible things he did to him that he hasn't done to him. Hmm. <laughs> it's like, you made me kill my best friend. <laughs> all right. Glad I took him out. Now I got to go kill my best friend. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah. Good, uh, good game, you know, uh, you know, kind of interesting world. I'm interested to see if the map makes more sense as, as it goes on, because right now it seems like this world is kind of the most boring Pangea. Mm. I mean, they've all kind of been like that. I mean, you're just kind of, you know, going from one biome to the other. Yeah, I think the thing is, the previous games, you know, because they, you know, in effect just, you know, in order to get to a new biome, it's like, oh, load up on the ship. You know, I think it was just kind of assumed that, you know, oh, you're going to, you know, a different region. Whereas this, it's just kind of a vaguely square-shaped continent that Mm. is, you know, divided up like a pie chart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's it, it is it does not become more sensical as you get further in the game. I can confirm. Yeah. Ah uh, well. You know, I I I'm looking forward to you know what what type of weather will will I see next though. <laughs> <laughs> um. What else you got? That is all I got. All right. Um, I only have a little bit here, uh, so <laughs> I had intended to be able to bring Final Fantasy 16 this week. The circumstances conspired to make it so that was not possible. Hopefully by the time we reconvene the week after uh, the 4th of July, I will have that and that will be uh, good and fun. Uh, based on everything I'm hearing, I've got two very small things, one of which is just a PSA. Uh, the first of which is I played the demo for Lies of P. Uh, oh, okay. because, right. because they are too cowardly to just call it lies of Pinocchio. They're trying to trick people into thinking it is not a Pinocchio game. <laughs> <laughs> they, they realized in focus groups that everyone hated that it was Pinocchio, but they'd already paid for the, uh, the they paid for the public domain license to that story <laughs> that is way older than copyright law. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't impressed like aesthetically, I imagine there are people who will find the uh, kind of clockwork, clockwork robotics, uh, clockwork robotic bloodborne, especially charming, you know, you like mean, I, uh, it, you mean steel rising. Oh, I, I forgot about that game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fans of steel rising will probably find something to like here. And like, I don't know, there are uh, it's it's not entirely as goofy. Like you wake up your Pinocchio and uh, you, your Pinocchio, who is visually indistinguishable from Timothy Chalamet to the point where <laughs> anytime blood or oil or whatever got on my character, I said, oh, no, my Chalamet. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you wake up in like this train that's crashed into this station uh, of this place where all of these puppets, these uh, kind of androids uh have uh gone uh plum loco i think is the uh is the term wait plum plum loco uh android you mean atomic heart yes yes yeah <laughs> uh and then you bloodborne <laughs> sorry them, and then you and then you bloodborne them to death until you get to a boss that i couldn't beat because i played this as part of a stream where i was covering demos from steam next fest 
uh, it plays like a sloppy, not very tight um, um, uh, Bloodborne, you know, uh, like the <sighs> I just uh, I didn't care for it. You mean Elden Ring? Sorry. <laughs> no. Mm, <laughs> wow. Mm. Shots fired. <laughs> like it's right down to, um, uh, you know, the having two different dodges. Like when you're locked on, you, you do the quick step. And when you're not, you do the you do the roll. Like it mm. is, it is actionably bloodborne in a way that I, again, I'm sure will appeal to a lot of people, but like I needed it to be a little bit more additive. Sure. Um, Does yeah. Does the regain system? No, uh, at least not that That's I had seen bad. so far. Yeah. Cause the regain so system is a really good idea. They're testing the limits of if it ain't broke. Yeah. The thing that made it feel most sloppy is the thing that most people have complained about, which is the dodge. Uh, it's just uh, there's a like this weird delay on it. Uh, like the iframes just do not feel like at all appropriate for what you are doing. Uh, ended up getting snagged by a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of attacks that I should have avoided. It felt like it felt good to hear other people say like, oh, yeah, everybody fucking hates the dodge in this. Um, however, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully they're going to change it. There's no guarantee that they will. As of right now, this kind of went from I, I'm just going to I'm, I'm going to not have an opinion uh, about it to I'll be really surprised if this holds up um, just because the demo didn't uh, did not impress me very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's too bad because, I mean, now, e- even though it wasn't um, oh, a great game like, um, oh, what what was the the cyberpunk like robotty? Um, You're thinking of the surge? Yeah. You know, was at least a different take on like the Soulsborne thing? Yeah. And yeah. like Mortal Shell with the whole ter- turn to stone thing was like, hey, you can make dodge different while still being dodge. Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's just a. I think you've hit on something, which is like each of those had something different. The surge had limb targeting, uh, mortal shell, obviously with the petrification, like. It's it's kind of not it's kind of not enough just to be like, hey, we're bloodborne, but the theming is different. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I think you got to you, you got to be a little bit more than that. Uh, I, I'm perfectly willing to be wrong about this. Like a demo does not en- encapsulate everything. Uh, you know, I could be reductive because I am seeing a reduced version of the product. But as of right now, just kind of like, eh, you know, so. That's yeah, a there's a there's kind of a, a lose lose for for devs anyway of, of doing a demo where it's like, all right, if they if they are excited about the idea and come in and, and love it, then they're exactly as likely to buy it as they were before. If they were excited about the idea and your demo does not perform perfectly, you can only make them less excited. Yes. <laughs> or if they're on the fence, like, I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty hard to win somebody over if you make a bad first impression with that. Like you might mm-hmm. actually lose people, uh, especially I, when your problems are your problem in a soul's like is so fundamental as the, uh, the dodge isn't there yet. <laughs> the only reason the dodge shouldn't be there is because you're out of stamina. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, so. I am kind of excited for the uh, lies of P uh, crossover with uh Wolong fallen dynasty. That was very strange to see. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't think it's going to make sense, but that doesn't mean it won't be entertaining. I, I mean, it is it is fun and good for <laughs> souls likes, not souls likes or whatever to uh, especially from smaller developers to kind of band together like that. Mm-hmm. I think that is a cool idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll be curious to see how it um, <laughs> I'll be curious to see how it articulates. It sounded like I was about to shit on it. I know nothing. So, yeah, dishonored. Uh, That's the other game I could joke about the plot, the setting being similar to. <laughs> Sorry, I knew there was one more. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, and the other one that's more of a PSA, but uh, I was browsing around the uh, the Apple uh, App Store on my phone, which is something I don't do because the mobile game space has been a fucking nightmare for what feels like ten years. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's real disappointing because that used to be something that brought me a lot of joy. Um, I didn't realize that there was a sequel to What the Golf. Uh, what? So that developer. Well, they made something for VR. Um, I forget what it was. But on the phone, if you have Apple Arcade, you can get and download and play What the Car. 
which is a <laughs> uh, like racing game kind of thing where you are completing courses. But like with the golf, which is that really wacky uh, uh, golfing game where every hole, like every little level is a different gimmick, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, <laughs> uh, except it is a it is a car. Uh, and I've not gotten very far in this, but it has brought similar amount of delight to me. Uh, and instead of just like revealing what your gimmick is when you're, when you go to like interact with it and see that like, oh, it's not my club that's moving. It's the world. When I, when I drag the do a hit here, uh, your, <laughs> your, uh, your, your character, your car, uh, or say the body of your car is always kind of launched into the level sometimes by a um uh by a cannon uh and it is revealed in a um uh like a little fanfare what you are doing so you'll press the button to launch and it'll be like car with legs (laughs) and and then you'll land and your car moves by principle of walking by by principle of ambulation great yeah yeah please please tell me there's a level that it's golf oh i mean it absolutely has to be again i haven't played very much of this this is more of a psa less to like respond to it the game seems perfectly delightful it seems like there's going to be a lot of tread on those tires where the tires exist on the car um but like i had no fucking idea this was out and apparently it's been out for a while wow yeah glad you found it i am too because i've got something to play on my phone and i've not paid attention to phone games i mean really since golf on mars uh maybe with that grappling hook game i I fucked around with that a little bit when you uh brought it uh dennis Mm -hmm. yeah so or this is sping uh was then the grappling you can't say that sorry no i thought you i thought you finished it i thought you ringed all the juice out of that one yeah so i I did uh, it's just it just sounds very impolite yeah um but um uh yeah no what 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 the car it's it it seems good i i'm excited to see the creativity of the studio back on display it's a shame what happened to mobile gaming yeah (laughs) yeah yeah and that's it for me multiplayer now it is time for the multiplayer where we ask you a question and you answer jolly you you came up with a hell of a question so uh what did you ask the nice people (laughs) i asked well we all know about those perfect matchups of voice actor to character but instead of that we are going to see who would you cast as what character from what game that would absolutely wreck the tone so an example would be like <laughs> peewee herman is corvo from dishonored <laughs> <laughs> uh and i'll get a start here with alexander who uh who says wallace sean as rex from mass effect that is perfect that is really <laughs> good rex is a big you know duh, it's a big warrior race kind of guy and having the having the short bald guy from princess bride in there is good <laughs> Oh, man. Um, uh, Dennis, what does Josh say? Josh says, without putting too much thought into it, Arnold Schwarzenegger as Link. Nothing but grunts the whole game and no dialogue. (laughs) Uh. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Uh. Lisa. (laughs) <laughs> oh, arnold is not i i know i know that's not link <laughs> yeah that, but it's still good hey listen if you want to leave <laughs> um david what does jeremy say jeremy says jack black as an enthusiastic announcer any game that would be a perfect funny thing match. is he actually was an enthusiastic announcer in um brutal legend it was pretty good yeah <laughs> he was i yeah. and he's also going to be a uh, claptrap in the live action borderlands movie that's apparently coming out that's, oh huh. okay that's <laughs> After, i have very mixed feelings about learning that but, yeah, uh, I, jack black <laughs> in anything is exciting borderlands um uh, in anything with talking is not <laughs> exciting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, after seeing him do Bowser, I trust him implicitly with literally anything. Around right. the internet right now, <laughs> there's like this whole thing about him like dressed up as Bowser singing the Peaches song live. There's like a clip oh, of yeah. it flying around on the internet right now. <laughs> Jack Black's oh, yeah. redemption arc from when people got really tired of him in the late 2000s and early <laughs> 10s has been very heartwarming because... He has always been an incredible, incredibly charismatic person. 
Yeah. Yep. I do have I, to say though, with with this answer, I am now remind uh, uh, imagining him doing one of the uh, one of the opening voiceovers from a From game, and it's pretty entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> that would wreck the tone. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, it would. Uh, Jala, what does uh, what does Nick say? Nick says Danny DeVito as Adam Jensen in Deus Ex: Human Revolution. I never asked for this. Indeed. <laughs> so anyway, I armed my typhoon and I started blasting. <laughs> 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 that is really good. I mean, is Danny DeVito distinct from the Frank Reynolds character at all at this point? I don't know. <laughs> that, that is that is his enduring legacy as Frank Reynolds. Um, Callum says, don't know why I popped into my head, but Charlie Sheen as Kratos. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Uh, maybe old trilogy Kratos, but Ooh. sorry. Anything with Charlie Sheen makes me. Yeah. <sighs> um, Dennis, what does uh, Peter say? Peter says Justice Smith, like his character from the Dungeons and Dragons movie, but voice cast as Titus in FFX. His D&D character would actually be pretty good as Titus. Uh, I think uh, th- what you're thinking of is Justice Smith as his The Quarry character. Yeah. <laughs> as Titus in Final Fantasy X. <laughs> Just a completely, completely flat out, flat effect. Well, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah because doesn't he do that that nervous chuckle somewhere in the quarry too at some point ah maybe i don't know anyway <laughs> I, I i was very poorly served by seeing justice smith uh by first seeing him in the quarry that is a cool character his performance is too flat for me holy shit the first place i saw him now looking at google was in um detective pikachu yeah he was was also in that. Mm-hmm. i did not at all make that connection wait was he pikachu the... because that would be amazing no that, no, was, that ryan was ryan reynolds, reynolds. Oh. Wait, what, what, what? which i would have accepted as an answer for this prompt um but no he was he was the opposite of uh, oh he was the main Twitter. he was the main kid yeah. i completely forgot that <laughs> right uh, so the quarry was not the first time that i saw justice smith huh no i talk about disappearing into a character yeah i never would have made that connection Thanks, Google. (laughs) Um, Let's see here. David, what does Ollie say? Ollie says, I really like Anna Kendrick. She seems like a nice lady, but I picture her doing Laura Croft as a voiceover, and it's just funny to me. (laughs) Something incredible. I I don't know who this is, so I'm not sure how to do a voiceover, but um, (laughs) something incredible happens and Laura gets hurt. Laura, that's like... Whatever, man. I mean, I guess it hurts and all, but gotta get, just get on with it and stuff. <laughs> I have uh, no idea who this is. She's the lead from the Pitch Perfect movie, so you gotta do like a like like a like a Disney uh, like a like a Disney young woman voice. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't I can't mimic that voice without coming off as incredibly sexist. So I'm not gonna <laughs> do it. Jala, but- you're up. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, no, no, uh, J- Jolly, you're you're up. What does uh, what does Sam say? <laughs> Sam says Chie's voice actress from the original PS2 version of Persona 4 doing every other voice in the game as well. I forget is Chie's PS2 voice actress particularly bad? I I don't know. I don't know. I can't recall. Um, yeah, no, I think that I think my memory of the PSP version has supplanted that. How, but, yeah. However, yeah. the thing about that, though, is that just like Chia's voice for every single character would still be wild. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. Yes. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> uh, David says, I would cast Gary Butterfield as Duke Nukem. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm not going to do an impression of that because I value our partnership. So. <laughs> but high, how high of a Patreon tier would we have to get to mm. for him to do that? Probably not very. It would actually probably be a really fun thing to give him. They'll do it on a duck stream. Make it a make it a duck stream donation tier. Right. Um, to get him to do that. Uh, let's hear case says, uh, I've got one actor, but he's been in two big recent releases, Ralph Ineson as Lorath and Diablo four and Sid and FF 16. And I replace both with Charlie day. 
Okay, so he's not <laughs> casting Ralph Innocent as those characters, uh, replacing both replacing. of them. <laughs> so taking the like gravelly, extremely deep gravitas of both of the uh, of anything that Alf, Ralph Innocent will bring, uh, and replacing mm-hmm. it with like the, the 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 squeaky screams of a child <laughs> <laughs> with oh. Luigi. Oh, um, Dennis, what does Alex say? Alex says, I'm just imagining President Eden voiced by Gilbert Gottfried instead of Malcolm McDowell. Ah, face to face at last. It's high time we met. <laughs> President Eden from uh, from Fallout 3, the uh, the AI president that she meets uh, uh, heading the enclave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, let's see, David, what does Dave say? I didn't do that on purpose. Dave says Christopher Walken as Batman in Arkham Asylum. And Jala posts the best Christopher Walken moments in Batman Returns. Yeah, like I literally <laughs> pulled that up because um, it, like I was just like, he was actually in Batman. You have to actually like watch Christopher Walken <laughs> in Batman Returns now. <laughs> mm-hmm. so. uh, I mean, Wait, who if, was he? Huh? Who, who was he? Max in, Shrek in or whatever, like the, the villain guy who <laughs> killed Catwoman. Oh, wow. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Max Shrek. Max Shrek was the German actor okay. who played Nosferatu. There you go. Or count, count, okay, count, well, count Max, Orlock, yeah. Max somebody or another yeah. in that <laughs> That no, I'm sorry. I wasn't making fun of you. That's just very funny. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, actually, Christopher Walken would do a very good Count Orlock. Yeah, um, yeah that would be mm. something. Yeah. Um... <laughs> But good catch, uh, actually uh, confirming that reconfirming that he was in the universe. Don also says uh, it's been on my mind, on my mind lately, so I will go with Yardley Smith, uh, the voice actress who plays Lisa Simpson as Ellie in The Last of Us, <laughs> with Larry the Cable Guy as Joel. Oh, oh no. no, you have. You, you have I, I think I. So I think that I think that Yardley Smith. Uh, God bless her. Lisa Simpson is a, is a, is a good character, like bringing uh, <laughs> bringing Lisa Simpson's like incredibly harsh moralism into the role of Ellie. That is oh a boy. bigger that is a bigger nightmare than having Larry the Cable Guy as Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care who you are. That's infected. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> thank you I, I i listen to his comedy on my headphones every night as i fall asleep okay yeah and it's doing some uh neuro-linguistic programming there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh it's not even his real name <laughs> um uh not even his real accent uh let's see here <laughs> i forget who was that was that you chala who read that no no who was it who read the year no that was me hey dennis what yep. does rookie say uh rookie says until dawn but every character is played by Jack, Jack Gleason. Uh, Jeffrey Barathion? Uh, Joffrey Baratheon from, uh, from Game of Thrones. He's the shitty little uh, boy king. Oh, that's Jack Gleason? Uh, <laughs> I think Jack Gleason. I can't see Jack Gleason without thinking of Jackie Gleason, you know, from the Honeymooners. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is is I'm that really that fucker's having name? trouble getting over it. Yeah. Man. All right. That's unfortunate. Or maybe very fortunate. Maybe that was how he got into show. Well, it oh, is. It is. It's got to be Game of Thrones, though, because look at the next line. Yeah. Is mm. it possible to kill off all the characters in one playthrough? Let's find out. <laughs> he does. He does do a very good job of playing a little shit. Mm-hmm. Um, David, what does Phil say? Phil says Fran Dresch- Dresher, Dresher? Mm-hmm. Dresher as Bayonetta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Fran Drescher played uh, uh, the lead on The Nanny. She has an incredibly, sh- uh, God, I, this is such a loaded sexist term, but it's accurate. Incredibly shrill voice. Mm-hmm. Like incredibly mm-hmm. shrill New Yorker voice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Fran Drescher is Bayonetta. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd check it out. I watch a YouTube video of that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jala, what does Jack say? Jack says, swap the voice actors for Leon and Salazar in the original RE4. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> no, your small time. <laughs> Austin says, the rock as Joker. The Rock as Elizabeth from Bioshock Infinite. <laughs> I guess he only has the one mode. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh. And uh, finally, here, Dennis, what does Kian say? 
Uh, they say any souls maiden being replaced by a fairy from Breath of the Wild. I can't remember oh, no. what her voice actress sounds like. What the what the fairy? I didn't sound know like. Zelda they games sound really horny. Now. <laughs> mm. Everybody, every fairy is horny for links. So gotcha, uh, gotcha. Well, I mean, so, fair. But then yeah. also, um, there's one more that came in last minute. Greg says Gilbert Godfrey as Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of dialogue. Wait, is that That's male ship or femme ship or both? both? Every one of them. <laughs> Why ask a question you already know the answer to, David? <laughs> <laughs> um, my answer is Tim Robinson as James from Silent Hill 2. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 I'm just going to leave it there. No impressions. Just, uh, yeah. Um, Dennis, how about you? Um, I want to see Jerry Seinfeld narrate Fallout. <laughs> What's the deal with war? It never changes. Oh, God. <laughs> David, how about you? Uh, so actually, appropriately enough, uh, Max Shrek as Kratos, <laughs> uh, by which I mean I want to see God of War as a silent movie. Ooh. <laughs> nice answer. Like German German impressionist silent movie. Yeah. Um, and Jala, how about you? So I have to first say I'm surprised nobody said Nicolas Cage for anything. Oh yeah, we got That's so many because responses. He's immaculate in everything he does. How dare you? <laughs> he would elevate literally any role. <laughs> Especially like a guy in, uh, was it Dead by Daylight? No. <laughs> dying, oh my God. You know, what? I, w- I would love Nicolas Cage to be the adoring fan in Oblivion. That would be great. <laughs> but anyway, right. that wasn't my answer. My answer is Polly Shore as Albert Wesker in any Resident <laughs> Evil entry. I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the tie, rim buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. I, I don't know. So I do not know no movie stars, uh, which may or may not have been apparent from uh, these. But in terms of characters that I think would be right for messing with, I think Ada. Uh, OK, just just because she's a character that so much trades on, you know, just. Not even being competent, just pretending to be competent. Oh, yeah, yeah. She makes <laughs> terrible decisions. Yeah. And so, like, any sort of character that undermined that whole persona when persona is all she has. Oh, my God. <laughs> the, the goofy voice actor. Like, <laughs> Goofy's voice as Ada. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, uh. Leon. Of course, <laughs> Leon, I double, I betrayed you again. <sighs> um, good question, Jala. This was fun. Yay, I did a good one. Yay. Yeah. Um, if you would like to participate in these in the future, you can go to Facebook and search for the Duck Feed community. Just put that in there and watch the prompts to go up on Monday afternoons. And thanks again, Jala, for posting it. Mm-hmm. The end boss. Now it is time for the end boss, where we talk about things that are happening in the world of video games around us. I'm going to do mine first, just because the sheer magnitude of what is happening here is, uh, I mean, mind boggling. I did not expect you walk into every Nintendo direct with an idea of, you know, roughly what's going to happen figured, Oh, they're going to do like a Pokemon expansion. There's going to be a splat fest. Just, uh, just, you know, you're making the like move on symbol with your hand, right? Just rolling mm-hmm. your fingers. Right. Um, but like, as I am cleaning my cat's litter box, listening to the Nintendo direct on my phone and I hear music from super Mario fucking RPG playing (laughs) i literally shouted what and nobody (laughs) nobody who knows english was an earshot uh yeah nintendo is answer for this (laughs) explain i know this game came out 20 years before you existed 25 years before you existed (laughs) um no uh nintendo is remaking super mario rpg and it's coming out on november the uh 17th some people are being real dipshits about the fact that uh Uh, the art style is hewing close to the original that's exactly what i want i don't want like photorealistic mario going around and attacking a birthday cake i want these cartoons doing it 
Um, I never thought that Super Mario RPG would happen, uh, either as a, you know, like a, uh, uh, I guess it came out to virtual console. It's legally complicated because it was a co-development between, um, Square Enix and Nintendo. Um, and like certain characters are still, you know, intellectual property of Nintendo or of, of Square Enix. So like we didn't get Gino in uh or Gino or Mallow in uh um uh Super Smash Brothers, right? Uh but it's coming out. Um yeah, November the uh the seventeenth. There's some hints of new mechanics in the uh in the in, in the trailer that they showed. Uh and I couldn't be happier. And just because throwing grenades into the future is the best way to make sure something happens, like when this thing comes out, I think it'd be real fun to stream because I am incredibly nostalgic about this game. It is not perfect, but like this along with Final Fantasy IV, uh, those were my first RPGs that I played. Uh, and it was real foundational oh, nice. for me. Yeah. Do uh, do any of you have experience with uh, with Super Mario RPG? I played yeah, it. Yeah, that on was. Em- oh. Yep. Oh, go ahead, Joel. I played it on emulator um, some number of years after the SNES was not extant anymore. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, th- that's basically what I was going to say. I I did play it a good deal, but on emulator and mm-hmm. very very positive, uh, you know, memories of it. I. I would honestly, I'm excited for this to get a remake. I'm more excited by the possibility that that might lead to sequels. Hmm. Now, now there's a cool idea. We'll see. Yes, please. Oh. I, uh, yeah, I've, I have watched Jen play Origami Kingdom on the Switch and then whatever the one on Wii was. Uh, oh gosh, super! Um, oh gosh, Super Paper Mario is what that was. Yeah, there it is. That mm-hmm. game is underrated. I like that a lot. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is a good one. Uh, I should I just... specify. I'm looking for uh, sequels to uh, Mario RPG that aren't dumbed down. Yeah, so not not like the Paper Mario. Uh, yeah. No, actually, I no actually paper. like wah, wah. Paper Mario a lot. It just didn't uh at least for me tap the same um yeah yeah the same kind of feeling like that that, that square enix kind of weirdness oh also the uh the composer is coming back uh oh. to consult on the rearrangements which is amazing i mean the, the the music is like half the reason you play i mean any square game from that era uh but uh also this one yeah, um, Jala, what is happening? <laughs> What's Google trying again? Yeah, we ask ourselves yet again, gentlemen, what nonsense is Google up to now? And Jeez. so the answer this time is tinkering with a product that would allow folks to play games on YouTube, allegedly called Playables. It will allow <sighs> users to play games instantly from YouTube via streaming service from their mobile phone or PC. Essentially, this is replacement for Stadia, which shut down in January. So um, they shut down Stadia because it didn't gain enough traction. So I don't know why they think this will be any different. I guess because YouTube (laughs) is more ubiquitous. Anyway, fun fact, Google was trying to sell the Stadia tech to Palatin for the bike company to gamify customer rides, but that didn't end up panning out. Nobody wants it. (laughs) It's... It's really weird how even uh, like a cash cow like Peloton could not. Wow. Yeah. Huh. They were like, nope, not going to happen. Yeah. Huh. Mm-hmm. They're just hoping Wait we'll forget. Wait a second. This is just Stadia with glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those assholes. Uh, God. After really? all those people who uh, like had their hearts broken as Google dashed their Stadia only projects on the rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Only too late. I mean, how long has it been? You said in January it shut down. Yeah. It hasn't even been a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, God. my my sister yeah. and her family definitely used um, Stadia all the time because that's how the oh. kids would play games. So. Oh no. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. No, I stopped trusting Google with new products after uh, they killed Google Reader. I remember that I think I, I, I think I was the one who reported on Stadia before it became a thing. And yeah, you had yeah. said it at that time. <laughs> <when> I <brought laughs> that. I said, did I say that exact th- that, that exact thing? Yeah. I am jaded because of Google Reader. <laughs> well, I think it was Google Glasses that you were talking about that time, but Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah. 
Uh, you have a much better memory for the things I say than I do. <laughs> Wait a second. This is just Google Reader with Google Glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, Dennis, what's happening in the uh, world of television, the small screen? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure that out, man. Um, so, you know, there, there's a whole trend right now of video games getting TV adaptations, and they're starting to get pretty good. Um, so yeah. naturally, like any any game that has like a strong narrative, uh, uh, you know, a world that you'd want to inhabit is, is probably going to get a shot. So why is Among Us getting a TV show? I can make I mean, a game I can, show, maybe. maybe <laughs> oh, yeah, like oh, I, oh, I could see that. Yeah, like a reality show would be really good. I, I can kind of, I can answer this because okay. of simplicity of premise. And because of a very distinct visual style, I think that I think that that that, that is enough to leverage for it. I think that there are a lot I of guess. like potential stories that they could bring to it. Um, that said, it would probably be better as like I don't know a flash animated series on Newgrounds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. if there's there's enough for uh, for Among Us to feed it to an AI script writer and see what comes out. I yeah, guess. probably that's a that's a, a sick burn, but well earned. I think. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I think my pitch for an Among Us like uh, franchise would be reality TV show, uh, you know, shot in like some international waters, <laughs> so that the uh, so that the imposter had to actually viciously like uh, annihilate people as they're trying to restart the boat's engine or whatever. You're basically describing Danganronpa. <laughs> you, be, you beat me I mean, to it. and look how successful that's been. True. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, that that bear has to be making some bank if he can build all those execution machines. Monokuma, please. <laughs> Indeed. <Yeah>. I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, still, I, I still insist that that bear is either Dang or Rampa. I'm not <laughs> sure which. <laughs> I, I now, whenever I'm incredulous about something, am going to go, Monokuma, please. Yeah. <laughs> Better than the alternative. And true. Yeah. Um, so, no. yeah, I, this is going. CBS Studios is making it. Um, it's signed off on by the developer, obviously. And um, apparently the people behind uh, Infinity Train, which I'd never heard of before. Oh, that's apparently a, is pretty good. That's actually a good show. Mm-hmm. Like Animation mm-hmm. Geeks, so I know who are. Um, yeah, no, that's. That is strange, and that that bumps this up a letter grade in anticipation, in my opinion. Yeah, so uh, Owen Dennis, I guess, is the guy behind that, which, hey, cool name. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, the animators uh, is going to be Titmouse, which is uh, known for Big Mouth and Legend of Vox Machina. So Yeah, that's uh, the Venture Brothers studio, too. Oh, nice. Okay. One of those was good. (laughs) Uh, You know, they, they seem to have the chops behind us. I just... Man, this is out of left field. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Could be good. Well, in a year, we'll all be singing its praises, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know. It's funny. Just because <laughs> the first big video game adaptation to come out after Last of Us is that uh, Twisted Metal show. And that looks god awful. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Which, I mean. <sighs> Twisted Metal <laughs> seems like it should be the easiest thing in the world to make yeah yeah i don't know just, just uh, the clips just that i've seen al- look very embarrassing yeah just yeah. allocate 90 percent of uh your budget to gore yeah 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 that and that's the problem is they're leaning into the comedy aspect of it i guess mm-hmm. like will uh, arnett is sweet tooth yeah uh anthony mackie is wasted on that mm-hmm. yeah um, maybe maybe get like uh, what's what's his name Cronenberg to direct it. <laughs> yeah, do oh, the no. body horror from the endings. Yeah. Um, David, what you got? I got nothing. At a boy. Um, how do you all feel about buttoning it up? Buttons. The credit. Don't Thank give you. Me a than that. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to level number 463. We really appreciate you making the time. Um, uh, Just a reminder, we're not going to be here next week. Sorry to do that so soon after I was traveling, but uh, I'm not going to make these nice folks record on a holiday. 
Um, so just uh, go listen to Jala Chans. Uh, sorry, nope, Jala's nope, Jala, Jala Chans, Chans place. place. There we go. You, you got me second guessing myself. <laughs> uh, go go check that out there. Um, what uh, wh- what can people expect to see this Friday again? All right. So uh, the last topical episode was on body dysmorphia and gender dysphoria. And that episode has been getting a lot of discussion. A lot of people have been saying it's very insightful. So that's the last topical mm. episode. The next a media episode is going to be on Metroid Fusion, and that one drops on July the 7th. So that will be one week from the release of this episode. Nice. Uh, so go check that out at uh, jollachan.place. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm, I'm paralyzed. <laughs> it's really not that hard. My name in the I, Zencaster is Jollachan in places. I mean, it's like. I, no, no. So, so, so what gets me is Jollachan's place versus Jollachan.place. Like the possessive S is uh, is, is what gets you. me. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, Jolla.chan.place. <laughs> yeah. Slash podcast hyphen. <laughs> yeah. In. <laughs> um, Dennis, where can people find you at Gen Con again? Yeah, at Booth 42. And you will find Lauren there. I will be uh, trying to just bask in a little bit of her glow. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um and I mean, for this show, you know how to help out a podcast. It's all really appreciated. Uh, I do streams on uh, on Twitch at the Duckfeed Twitch channel. Uh, that's just Duckfeed TV. Uh, yeah, that's all the stuff. Um, I've been Cole Ross. You can find me on Blue Sky at Cole Ross. I've been Dennis Furia. You can find me in the Deck of Wonders Discord. I'm David Mysmith. And I'm Jalachan in any place I can be found. As long as I spell it right. Or say it right. (laughs) Or whatever you're doing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right. Who has titles? I have one. Go ahead. Gorsh, Leon, I betrayed you again. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty good. Yeah, the one I want to have was, hey, listen, but that's entirely the voice. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. I have oak furniture and hard candy. Uh, (laughs) We're all surfing on lava and some kind of gator mancer. (laughs) Uh, Dennis, what you got? I had surfing on lava as well. Okay. Um, I also had Gorsh Leon. (laughs) Pretty good. Um, I also had another exclamation. Oh no, my Chamlet. (laughs) Oh no, my Chalamet. Yeah, what'd I say? Yes, Chalamet. Chalamet. Oh no, my Uh, Cham. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, what, what, What was your first one on there? Uh, surfing on lava, Gorsh Leon, and then oh no, my Chalamet. Um, it ha- it has to be Gorsh Leon. I betrayed you again. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, it is decided. <laughs>